And we are on the air with breaking news. We want to get right to Concord, where Governor Sununu is updating the state's coronavirus response. Um, well, it is, uh, it's great to be here. Um, we know that there's a, a obviously quite a large storm uh, going on out there, and we hope everyone has been able to weather it uh, safe. Um, and uh, hopefully most folks are just at home, comfortable and safe, maybe with a cup of hot chocolate or something. Um, uh, just a little reminder on the storm before we get started around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic inf inf information that we want to put out. Uh, if you are out and about, obviously, please, um, the drifts are high. If there are loved ones out there uh, or neighbors that may be uh, just checking in on them a little bit would be great. We do have 700 different uh, pieces of machinery that are out on our roads today, uh, both on the state and local side. Uh, they'll be cleaning up as the storm heads out over the next hour. So uh, just be careful with that. Obviously, a lot of kids are out sledding and having fun in the, in the light snow. Um, but uh, we just want to make sure that, that folks are driving if you don't need to be on the roads. If you could give those plows just a little while longer. Um, the emergency uh, winter storm warning is in effect through 4 p.m. this afternoon. Um, but the good news is we think that most of the state should be cleaned up and in good shape by this evening. Uh, and we just want to thank everybody for their patience uh, through the storm. A, a lot of folks were able to stay off the roads. Uh, we did have some power outages, pretty minimal, given how uh, light and fluffy a lot of this snow was. Uh, but there were a few power outages out there, and there are crews uh, just kind of taking care of those last individuals um, across the state. So uh, we weathered the storm pretty well. It looks like it's going to be uh, a white Christmas and a white holiday season for all of us. That's a, that's a good thing. I think that puts folks in the right spirit. Um, with that, I guess we'll start with uh, Dr. Daly and the public health update. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. So today we'll be announcing 872 new people who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, bringing our total case count to 34,264. In the last week, we've averaged around 800 to 900 new infections per day in our state. And we currently have 6,928 people with active infection. On average, around 8,000 people are being tested in our state each day, and about 9% of those people are testing positive. Currently in New Hampshire, we have 284 people who are hospitalized with COVID-19 statewide. And today we're announcing, sadly, that there have been four new individuals who have passed away due to COVID-19, bringing the number of people who have died to 629. Three of these individuals are associated with long-term care facilities. We continue to conduct our contact tracing efforts for people who are at highest risk for transmitting their infections, such as people working in congregate settings, healthcare facilities, and schools. For people who test positive and who we do not reach out to, we're asking them to do the right thing by staying at home and then notifying those people who have been close to them while they were potentially infectious. In order to support you in doing that, we have made some resources available right on the homepage of our nh.gov slash COVID-19 website. There are two buttons right at the top there for if you've tested positive or if you've been told you were exposed. And we're really asking everyone to follow those guidelines very carefully so that we can prevent future transmission. We know that COVID-19 has been a hardship for our communities and together we've endured these last 10 months. So we're very excited about the potential of this COVID-19 vaccine and bringing this pandemic under control and saving lives. To date, we have distributed 3,135 doses of the Pfizer vaccine to our hospitals. And in the last two days, there have been 901 frontline health workers vaccinated to protect, protect them against COVID-19. This new Pfizer vaccine and the upcoming Moderna vaccine, however, both require two doses in order to be completely protected at that 95% efficacy. So we expect that we'll have to continue vaccinating individuals and that we'll need in, um, vaccine going forward coming into the state. We expect that it's going to continue coming into the state over the coming weeks and months and we'll be able to at, offer vaccine to additional individuals who want to receive the vaccine. It will take several months to get everyone vaccinated. This means that we must continue to make sure that we're taking our COVID-19 precautions, especially now as we head into the holidays where we want to come into closer contact with our family and friends. But we want to remind everyone to please be careful and make sure that they wear a mask, avoid those gatherings, stay at least six feet apart from everyone, 
And then we continue to recommend that people avoid traveling during the holidays, even travel within New England. We know that people are growing tired of these precautions, but we don't want you to give up on them and we want to finish strong. Thank you. Good afternoon. I have a brief uh, long-term care outbreak update. Today we are closing four outbreaks in long-term care facilities, Oceanside Genesis, Prospect, Wo Prospect Woodward Home at Hillside Village, Ridgewood Genesis, and Studley Home Assisted Living. They're, they are all closed. We are also announcing eight new outbreaks today. The Arbors of Bedford, Clippert, Clipper Harbor Cedar Healthcare Center, Community Bridges in Concord, Country Village Center, Harris Hill Center, Merrimack County Jail, Mount Prospect Academy, Seacoast Treatment and Stabilization Center, and the Stratford County Jail. Our outbreak tables with the numbers of staff or residents will be updated with our daily report um, either today or tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, so a, a couple things we want to bring uh, folks up to speed on, uh, specifically the vaccine. Uh, just uh, again, I, Dr. Daly touched on it uh, a little bit, uh, but obviously that's kind of the hot topic of the week, if you will. Um, as everyone knows, on Tuesday we administered uh, the first uh, doses of the vaccine. Uh, the first person to get the vaccine in the state was um, Heidi Kukla, uh, the ICU nurse over at, at Elliott Hospital in Manchester. I think uh, anyone who was watching that press conference on Tuesday morning, um, I think her words, I think, struck with a lot of us. And uh, I think she said it better than anyone, why the, the vaccine is so necessary and uh, something that uh, has clearly resonated in a very positive way across the state. It's a safe vaccine. Uh, a lot of folks in, in our health care are, are taking it as we speak. Uh, uh, the long-term care facilities are, are getting theirs as we speak. So um, we're really on a, on a very positive path here. Um, there were some questions given today's storm. Um, uh, hats off to the team at Public Health uh, who made sure that with the storm coming, uh, kind of made some alterations to the vaccine delivery and made sure that uh, we kept up to speed and, and on schedule. So um, we didn't let the storm interfere with the vaccine, va vaccine delivery system uh, for the state and, and for our citizens. Um, uh, over the next week, uh, I think we had about 12,000 uh, doses of the vaccine come in this week. We'll get tens of thousands of more uh, before year's end. That's uh, very positive news, uh, which also includes Moderna's vaccine, uh, which we should be receiving the first shipments of uh, early next week. Uh, and as a lot of us know, the Moderna vaccine is uh, being manufactured uh, very much right here in New Hampshire, which is a, a bit of point of pride for a lot of us Granite Staters. Um, some questions earlier today also on uh, what we're seeing out of Washington, D.C. I think we're all very hopeful um, that uh, Congress can actually get something done. Um, uh, as with anything related to Washington, I'm, I'm not holding my breath with anticipation, but it looks like they're getting closer and closer, uh, hopefully in the next 48 hours, to getting uh, some type of agreement and, uh, and package passed. Um, in the event that they do actually get their act together and pass something, it does not look like there will be um, uh, uh, funds for uh, state relief or uh, relief direct aids to cities and towns. Uh, that's something that we've been advocating very strongly for. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that will be in there, but that's okay. Um, uh, something is definitely better than nothing. It looks like they're focusing a lot of their efforts on small business relief, uh, some type of p addition to the PPP program, uh, maybe some unemployment relief, some potential stimulus checks is what we're hearing. And obviously, it looks like there'll be some funds in there for uh, vaccine distribution and some other COVID-related costs, which is, uh, frankly, the, the of our cost right now, uh, something that we, we definitely need uh, and would be very appreciative of, um, as we know that this is going to remain with us uh, for the next couple months, to be sure. Um, I just want, want to rest assured, rest, let people know, rest assured, uh, if Congress does do nothing, um, uh, we'll be okay. Uh, in that uh, we, we can, our economy is very strong. We have general funds we can tap into to make sure vaccine continues to be distributed, to make sure that we're still buying the PPE that we need for the state. We, we're going to have testing capability. So um, it would be great if, if Congress uh, lived up to the obligation that they've set for us and, and got it done. But even if they don't, um, the state is in a good economic position um, and we will have funds available at a local level uh, to make sure that we have what we need uh, to carry forward through, through the remainder of the the pandemic one way or another. Um, 
The last thing we want to do is just talk about some CARES Act allocation. So of the $1.25 billion of flexible CARES Act funds that we received back in uh, March or April at this point, um, we have to spend pretty much all those dollars by, or all those dollars by uh, December 31st. So there's only a couple weeks left. Um, a few of the programs that we've allocated all this money to have lapsed funds, meaning uh, we may, broadband is a good example. We allocated $50 million. Only about $15 million in projects were eligible. So that $35 million kind of lapses back in and we can reallocate those dollars. Well, the final reallocation of dollars um, that we're looking at over the next week or so, uh, we still have some money available to us. And knowing where some of the highest hit areas are, uh, specifically around uh, hospitals uh, especially, uh, we want to at least create some opportunity. So a couple things. First, let's talk about UNH. Um, you know, UNH, the university system has done a tremendous job uh, increasing our testing capacity for the state, doing literally thousands of tests a day sometimes uh, for the state, for their students, and now also assisting uh, the state as most of their students are on break, assisting the state with some of our additional testing capacity needs. We'll be allocating an additional $4 million to the university system to offset some of their additional costs uh, that they did not anticipate, but uh, frankly, they were just testing at such a high rate. That's all really good stuff. So about $4 million will be allocated to uh, the university system. An additional $7 million is going to be allocated directly to hospitals and specifically the hospitals that have been hardest hit uh, with the COVID pandemic. We know that a lot of hospitals have had to give up uh, certain elective procedures, uh, elective surgeries. Those are kind of their money makers sometimes, frankly. Um, and they've given that up to make sure that the beds and capacity are there for our citizens. Um, and so we're going to put a, our last $7 million into the hospital system. That combined with an additional over $70 million that the federal government is also allocating this week to our hospitals and providers um, creates a, a lot of economic opportunity uh, for hospitals and doctors that have really been hard hit by this. So um, that's all very, very positive news. And then finally, the, our final allocation is committing on something that we talked about quite a long time ago. Our nonprofits traditionally have to pay a part uh, for their unemployment insurance. Um, they've been very hard hit. The federal government has offered to pay for part of their unemployment insurance. Uh, the state is picking up the rest of that cost for our nonprofits, which includes our hospitals. So there's about $12 million that we're going to be allocating to ensure that that cost is not borne by nonprofits, for about six, seven, eight million dollars of which uh, will directly offset costs in our hospitals as well. Uh, but we want to make sure they're not carrying that that cost burden, um, and that'll be uh, frankly one of the final allocations that we do uh, as part of the CARES Act. We've spent it down almost to the penny, frankly. Uh, we've I, we've tried to schedule this out, and um, I think the team did a great job. The team at Gopher did a great job of, uh, of making sure that we had emergency funds available all the way to the end of the year uh, and we were taking care of some of these last minute costs um, as they potentially uh, hit the state. Um, with that, I guess we can open it up for, for questions. Governor, Hi, uh, can you describe how you decide which doctors and nurses get the vaccine first? Is there a scoring system? Or I don't know if HHS or Dr. Daly wants to wait. Yeah, Dr. Daly, want to talk about that? How do you sure. that? Yeah, you bet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the way that we have allocated our vaccine initially is that we want to target those healthcare workers that are at highest risk. Uh, these are people who provide direct patient care and then also healthcare workers who are in patient care areas and may come into contact with um, those patients who could be infected with COVID-19. Eventually, we'll also get to other people who work in healthcare settings who might not have direct patient care, but were perform critical functions and we want to obviously uh, get everyone who's performing critical functions as well too but they are going to come in later phases so it's really looking at that person's specific role are they caring for patients and that would put them at high risk and that they should be vaccinated in this first phase so COVID units first essentially and then moving out from there <clears throat> it's it's up to the hospitals to look at their organization and determine who is at highest risk and we have made some suggestions to them for determining who to vaccinate first because they did not get enough to do all of their highest risk health care workers. So they're going to look for areas where the staff are going to have the greatest likelihood of coming into contact with someone with COVID-19. That includes those COVID-19 units, might include the ED, for example, uh, the emergency department, and then uh, work their way out from that. And Sorry, is inoculation immediately after the second shot or is it, a, what, what I guess, when can you consider someone in, like inoculated? 
It takes about one to two weeks to develop antibodies against the virus after you have received that vaccination. So in order to get that complete 95% protection that we believe this vaccine offers, it would be about one to two weeks after that second dose. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I'm going to grab a pen here. Can you describe, we've heard media reports that uh, some places have been able to expand the amount of vaccinations they're giving based on that the vials have more dose in them, I guess, have you heard about this? There's, there's some places where they're getting more vaccine. Do, is that happening here? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So this formulation that's currently available to us, Pfizer, uh, requires where adding saline solution to the vial that contains a suspension uh, with the vaccine ingredients within it. And when they re reconstitute that and create that vaccine that's then going to be administered to the person, it provides enough for five doses definitively. Um, in some cases, they may have remaining vaccine, which if they have a full dose available after they use those first five doses within that one vial, they can go ahead and administer that to another person. So we're working with communicating to the hospitals who have this vaccine currently around this process and making sure that um, they're able to account for those doses, report that those doses have been administered to us. But we are hearing from the FDA that this is acceptable as long as it's a full dose and they do not mix leftover amounts from different vials into one to get that full dose. So it has to be a complete dose from one vial that is remaining. How much does that expand our current supply, theoretically? Well, it's typically one extra dose per vial. So I haven't done the math. If, if, it, if it worked for every vial, then it would be at most 20%, but, uh, which is even just getting a couple more. I mean, that's, that's great. We'll take any, any, any amount that we can get. So. I know you had mentioned um, it depends on what happens with Congress, but with all this CARES Act money that we've gotten and allocated, what happens in 2021? It, do you expect any new aid coming to, I like, do. to the states? I do. No, I expect something to happen. I think it would be great if this Congress uh, got something done uh, before they left. It's kind of the lame duck Congress uh, before the new uh, group comes in. Um, I can tell you I was, I was on a call with all the governors and uh, President Biden yesterday, uh, President-elect Biden. and. Um, you know, just uh, it was clear that they want to get something done as well. So I think they'll see what this Congress gets done and, and whatever else might be needed. They're, they'll be looking to do their own bill with the new Congress a, as well. So um, I, I do remain fairly confident that even if we don't get something this week, um, there's going to be a lot of pressure and, and the right pressure, frankly, to make sure something gets done uh, early in the year. Whether it's before President-elect Biden takes office or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but the Congress and Senate could step up prior to that if, if necessary. A long time before kids get vaccinated. Obviously, most are heading on to uh, winter break at this point. Uh, what's is there a plan to try and reduce spread? Because we were seeing those numbers bump up in that younger age group. I mm -hmm. guess it's going to be three, four, five months before they get that. Uh, well, yeah. Right now, technically, the the vaccine is not authorized for under 16 years old. Uh, so, uh, if, if either future vaccines are, are authorized that way, or the current uh, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines go through additional studies that allow them to be authorized for future use for uh, children. Uh, that is something that really remains to be seen. Um, until then, we don't know uh, what the stipulations or the risks are, are, are around that. So we're just asking folks to take um, a lot of the precautions that we've already put into place. Uh, we've been very fortunate that well, we've had clusters of illness in some of these schools, no major outbreaks, um, no major uh, interclassroom community transmission, you know, across um, the, uh, you know, across, you know, multi-classroom is multi-disciplines. Some schools have pulled back, um, have either gone remote for a week or two here or there, but uh, this, then they get the kids right back in. So everyone's finding a way to manage, and that's, that's the good news. Um, there's been very little um, illness amongst children and students that didn't already have another complicating uh, condition, uh, and even that's been, been fairly rare. So that's, that's the, the silver lining, if you will, on, on any of this. So we're just asking folks to stay disciplined, uh, keep those practices, we'll keep an eye on your kids. You know, when, when you get the, um, a lot of schools require a temperature to be taken and students to be asked the, the questions, you know, of symptoms and, and whatnot prior to the beginning of every day. Take that seriously. And we do it in our family. Well, you know, every morning I'm asking my daughter those questions and I'm putting it in on, the, on her school's website. Um, and we're doing the temperature checks, keep it up. I mean, because those really are the precursor signs for, for what could be um, a domino effect of, of getting other kids uh, infected. And, and you just don't know. It's, 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 again, you don't know who those kids come in contact with every day. 
Um, you have to under appreciate that a lot of kids are being taken care of by their grandparents right now. And they have to go home and be with them one way or the other, and, and it just does drive a higher risk. And so, uh, as we always say, it's, it's not about ourselves. It's just about, you know, understanding that we don't know um, the, uh, the risk that our, the people we come in contact with might have. Um, back and forth with me, Adam. Uh, yesterday, there was 21 deaths announced. I think it was the, the highest single day. Uh, also, seven hospitalizations. That was high for one day. Um, are we starting to see the effects of Thanksgiving of, of that time? I don't know if somebody wants mm -hmm. to talk about that or. Yeah, so, you know, yesterday was a tough day. Our, our numbers were, were very, very high, and, and that can be for a variety of reasons. But um, what we do know is that as you see these peaks of case numbers across the country, we even saw it earlier this year here in New Hampshire, the hospitalization and, unfortunately, the fatality that results from that tends to lag by a couple weeks. So uh, our hope is that we're kind of in this, kind of bouncing around near the top right now. Uh, we've only had a day or two maybe cross a thousand cases um, so it's still very very high of course um, you know our hospitalization rate is sitting still a little under 300 which is high nothing we can't manage but it's high my sense is hospitalization and unfortunately the resulting fatalities may stay elevated for a couple weeks even if we start coming on the downswing of daily cases uh, because the symptoms take a while to progress. I mean, so it's just a mathematical uh, follow along, if you will. Uh, often the symptoms are worse in the second week, which drives the hospitalization. So um, we're just, even when, if our numbers, if we're fortunate to see our numbers start going down in the next couple weeks, um, we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, and we still have to know that these outbreaks, especially in the long-term care facilities, uh, can be extremely dangerous. And, um, and so un unfortunately, I just, I suspect um, I just I, I don't think it'd be appropriate to sugarcoat it. I suspect that you know the fatalities and hospitalizations are still going to be elevated for for quite some time. Well, especially with the holidays that are happening and then Christmas next week, exactly. um, expecting that to be part of. Yeah, the you know I got to tell you I think I, we've talked about it a little bit. I think the people of the state did a very good job over Thanksgiving, keeping their 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 group gatherings smaller. Um, we heard a lot of rumors and, and stories of well we were going to have different parts of our family, but we decided to cancel and everyone did their own thing. Um, and we suspect and hope that that will be the mentality as we go into Christmas. But still, you're st we still saw a lot of cases within the immediate family. Um, obviously, we're not asking the immediate family not to associate with one another. Uh, and so that, that very well may happen over Christmas as well. Not here in New Hampshire, but all across the country. I mean, we're, we're kind of all in the same boat there a little bit. Um, so we did see a bit of that bump after Thanksgiving with our case numbers. Um, that's probably driving what you're seeing a little bit t today. We could see another bump. You know, even if we're on the downswing a little bit by Christmas, you could see potentially another bump up. Um, all just uh, telltale signs that, that we got a long way to go. We have to stay disciplined for quite some months uh, ahead, unfortunately, and, um, and until the vaccine really gets through our population, you know, we're not gonna be out of the woods just yet. You mentioned that the lag indicators and that discipline it's gonna take. You have these amazing headlines of here's this vaccine in just a matter of months, what an achievement. At the same time, deaths uh, mount. It's a lot to balance, I guess, for the public, and you still have to worry about the COVID fatigue factor is that something that is really uh, very much um, the COVID fatigue factor is something that weighs on us all the time how do we uh, properly get the message out that we have to stay disciplined um, at the same time we're, we're we're working on messaging why the vaccine is safe and why it's it's good to take and a lot of folks are making that vaccine decision not just for themselves for a healthcare worker we've seen the uptake in healthcare workers phenomenally high that's wonderful uh, a lot of people are deciding whether their loved ones maybe in a long-term care facility are they going to sign that consent form um, and we want folks to know that it is safe and, and we feel very confident that there will be a, a high usage right there. Um, and then uh, balancing out, you know, the, the, the very tough stories of, of even while we're at the beginning of the end, unfortunately there is going to be some lag here. We are going to likely see a bump over, over the, the holidays. Um, and, uh, and ultimately that may result in, in a little, potentially more hospitalization and more fatalities. And, and we're, we have to be prepared for that. Um, you know, when it comes to long-term care facilities, um, we're on the phone with them every single day, whether it's the, the VA, the, the state veterans home, uh, or any long-term care facility, frankly. Whatever they need, we're there for. We have stockpiles of PPE. We put funding on the front lines uh, to our, the, with the additional stipends, trying to incentivize the workers to be there, and they've given uh, so much, I mean, 20 hours a day sometimes, just doing everything they can to, to stay viable within their own facilities and take care of, uh, of those patients. Um, uh, testing, uh, you know, doing uh, increasing the, the amount of testing and availability for testing for them. Um, we've just put everything we can, but we just know that these long-term care facilities really are on the front lines of this and are, are 
unfortunately have always faced the brunt of this this very tough virus. So. Do you have a target date for the majority or almost all of that long-term care population to have received the vaccine? Our most vulnerable population, the first 100,000 of phase one, should likely have their uh, at least their first shot within the first couple weeks here and their second shot by the end of January. So that's the entire long-term care population? Uh, that would account for, yeah, I think that that's all of long-term care. I'm looking over here, I think that, that would include all phase 1A and 1B, yeah. Which is great news, right? I mean, there, and then again, there'll be a little lag and hopefully again, the hospitalization and fatalities uh, by, by mid-February, theoretically, hopefully start really start dropping and, and that will be, I think, a big sigh of relief for all of us, so. Do we have some questions on the phone? Yes. Governor, the next question comes from Holly Raymer with the Associated Press. Holly, go ahead with your question. Hi, thank you. Um, we're hearing from several states, um, officials from several states are saying they have been told they'll receive fewer doses of the Pfizer vaccine this week than they had anticipated. Um, have you heard anything like that? How many were we expecting and is that still the case? Uh, yes, we have heard that. Um, we were originally expecting about 12, 13,000 vials approximately uh, next week. I think that number is going to be reduced down to uh, around 9,000, maybe even just shy of 9,000. Um, again, we take everybody gets their pro rata share by state. So New Hampshire isn't treated any differently than any other state. Uh, but uh, because of uh, production and how they're managing their production, unfortunately, uh, at least for the next couple of weeks, it's, it's going to come in a little bit short of what we were originally told. Um, but it's still, you know, 9,000 doses and, and we'll take it and use it. Governor, the next question comes from Nancy West with In-Depth NH. Nancy, go ahead with your question. for taking my good afternoon governor thank you for taking my question you bet i know that thing, there's been quite a bit of concern about um people testing positive legislators testing positive who attended the gop caucus november 20th in manchester and then it, it followed by the organization day december 2nd and of course the tragic death of house speaker dick hench and the infection of speaker pro tem and some house staffers and um, state house staffers and i guess my question my first question is will you say how many legislators and staffers connected to the state house have tested positive for covid19 i did ask that question of the department of health and human services and they said they would not answer that because of privacy protection. Of course. My, how would releasing the number of people who tested positive, how would that violate anyone's privacy? So um, I have I, a couple of questions. Sure. No, I, yeah, well. No, no, let me answer that one first. Again, I, we don't, I don't get a running tally of how many legislators or staffers in the State House necessarily have COVID. We know that some do. Um, that's private information. Um, just because we work in the, in, you know, we, it's a different branch of government. Just because we're elected officials, we don't, um, that, that's private information. So we wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't have that number. I couldn't tell you how many uh, Republicans or Democrats have tested positive for COVID that are elected representatives. Um, I know a couple staffers, just because I know them personally, uh, that have um, uh, uh, been infected um, at the State House. But, um, but I, that you literally know as much as I know about that at this point because it's private information and just because they work in a certain building doesn't mean we make public all, all of that all of that information and data. Is there another question? Yeah, um, I guess I've been told by a couple of legislators that they're concerned that the state house could be becoming a super spreader where you have lawmakers coming and going and staffers coming and going some gop staff, uh, lawmakers refusing to wear masks and then taking the the virus home to their community if they are in fact infected but how will we know if they are in fact infected i know that when um senator martha fuller clark tested positive she put out a re news release to that effect and another release when she recovered um, do you think that people have a right to know if their elected officials have tested positive for the virus? Um, 
So a, a couple things there. If someone tests positive for the virus, it is their choice and up to them whether they want to release that. That is medical information uh, that is typically held private. But if someone wants to tell the public that, that is um, absolutely their choice. I do know um, the, the legislative, uh, Senator Chuck Morris, um, and Sherm Packard in the House side worked with Dr. Ballard at Health and Human Services. They set up their own testing day to make sure that anyone who wanted a test could get a test. Um, when you talk about a super spreader, those, a super spreader is a, sing, is a singular event, a singular point in time. A super spreader is not a location. So it's not like, uh, you know, the, I w I've been at the State House all day today. It's not like the State House itself is, is infected and if you walk in you're going to get infected with COVID. Super spreader events uh, do occur, but those are single points in time. Um, I know they're constantly cleaning the State House. Um, I, I know that they've offered testing to everybody. Um, in terms of what information is released to the public for those individuals uh, who have tested positive, that really is up to those individuals. Um, you know, we don't ask elected officials to put all their health records out on public display. Um, and that's effectively what you're asking. And so um, I, don't, I don't think it's appropriate. Now, that being said, they need to make provisions. And I've been very, uh, you know, it's just my opinion. The legislature makes their own rules and, and pathway. Um, I don't really have a say in that, but I've been very uh, public and, and I think a lot of folks agree with me that they just need to make sure they make provisions so that if they have hearings, if they do anything that engages with the public or even their own members, they al allow that process to take place remotely as well as in person for the, any individuals who don't feel comfortable potentially coming in um, uh, to certain situations, whether it's from the public that might testify, whether it's from a, a representative or a senator uh, that might also uh, be in, on a committee or whatever it might be. So they have to use the technology that is afforded to them to allow the legislative process to take place uh, in a safe way. And, and anyone who does come in, of course, um, you know, we've been very, <laughs> been very adamant and, and very strong in our messaging that people need to wear masks and they need to make provisions for the social distancing for the health and safety of those individuals so that to your point you don't get a super spreading event uh, at any single um, a hearing or, or gathering uh, of the such. Is there another one? Governor the next question oh. comes from Michael Graham with the New Hampshire Journal. Michael go ahead with your question. Yeah, one quick question for the uh, medical pros and one for the governor. First, for the medical pros, I'm trying to understand the numbers on hospitalizations. The daily update for yesterday had 870 cumulative hospitalizations, just 41 higher than on November 30th. But the number of people hospitalized yesterday was 286, which is 126 higher than November 30th. So which, which number is right? What are we supposed to be looking at? So uh, I'm going to actually answer that because I play a medical professional on TV every Thursday at 3 o'clock. Um, so uh, you, you're exactly right. It's, it, is, it can be a little confusing. Um, w the, the way contact tracing works is, you know, through contact tracing, we, we, we ask folks if they've been hospitalized and what the situation is. Uh, and that's often the daily number that you see. The, the most, I think the most important number is the total hospitalization number. Um, that could include folks that don't uh, let us know that they're, that they're in the hospital. Uh, it could include non-New Hampshire citizens. Uh, maybe citizens from, from Massachusetts might be up here or, or whatever it might be for various reasons. Um, you know, they may be in a hospital up here. So there's a couple different reasons why the total hospitalization number, the census, if you will, uh, doesn't necessarily add up, or is usually a little bit higher uh, than if you added just all the daily numbers that we report um, because we just get, we're just getting an, an information from so many different uh, locations. So uh, the most important number is that total daily census. Uh, that's the most accurate number in terms of how many COVID patients are in, be are in a bed at any given time. But um, we only do contact tracing with our New Hampshire city. So if you're a Massachusetts citizen, but you're in a New Hampshire hospital, we wouldn't necessarily know and they wouldn't necessarily be recorded as part of our daily number. And I'm getting nods that I actually great. got that one right. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, we'll, we'll grade you on a curve. Okay, thank fine. you. Um, so uh, there's been some concern about how Republicans have handled the COVID issue. You had the question just earlier from another reporter and uh, some people are uh, unhappy with the general state of the Republican Party here in New Hampshire. Former two-term New Hampshire Party chair Jennifer Horn just announced that she's leaving the Republican Party because she's so unhappy with the party. What would you say to your fellow New Hampshire Republicans who are looking at whether it's COVID or the Electoral College or presidency, whatever, and they're saying, it's time for me to leave the party. What would your message to them? Yeah, what would my message be to someone who wants to leave the Republican Party? Bye. 
I, I, yeah, I mean, if someone doesn't doesn't want to be part of a, of a party or an independent or a Democrat, yeah, it's their choice. That's fine. I, I, you know, the party isn't defined, and the Democrat Party isn't defined by a single individual or a single issue. Neither is the Republican Party. Um, it's a philosophy. It's a, it's a belief in terms of how you believe civics and government should be um, uh, conducted, um, what's appropriate in terms of, uh, you know, public participation, taxation, all of those uh, issues. So um, nobody should define their political party based on the COVID pandemic uh, or, or, or based on just a single point in time uh, of the current political strife that, that we see in this country. And it's everyone's choice. You know, everyone, everyone can, do, can do exactly what they want. So, you know, I'm a very proud member of the Republican Party. And, you know, uh, I think we, we do it right here. I think we, we maintain that, that New Hampshire advantage. It's very important to us and, and us, those of us on, on our side of the aisle. And some people agree, some people don't. And again, if people can come and go with the party as, as they please, it's their right to do so. Governor, the next question comes from Jordan Hain with the New Hampshire Public Radio. Jordan, go ahead with your question. Hi, I've got two questions today. Um, the first is about um, a story that NHPR reported this week about the upbreak at Green Mountain Treatment Center, um, where multiple clients and staff data management was unprepared for the outbreak. Um, CDC and state recommendations weren't followed. Staff were moving COVID positive people into rooms with people who had tested negative or hadn't kept it, hadn't been tested at all. Um, so what's your response to that? And does the state have plans to take action given that Granite Recovery Center's contract with the state? Um, and the second is about vaccine distribution. Um, Long-term care facilities are preparing to potentially start distributing vaccines on Monday through the uh, through a partnership with pharmacies. but. A few are saying they've had next to no communication with their pharmacies and have pretty much no idea when they'll be getting vaccines. So is the state doing anything to intervene there? And is there any kind of backup plan um, should problems with those partnerships continue? Sure. I'm going to turn it over to the commissioner for both the long-term care. Um, yeah, and grant recovery. Got it. Thank you for that question. Um, the What you're hearing about granite recovery, we did get some communication about that and the AG's office uh, will be looking into that. And certainly um, they're licensed by the state of New Hampshire. So if, if anything comes out of those investigations and the questions that we would ask um, re related to what the employees are reporting, what, what, what you've just said, then we can certainly send a team down to do an infection control tutorial um, or do an inspection. So we have heard that and we are, we are looking into it. When it comes to long-term care vaccine, um, the pharmacy partners have three weeks from the date they receive the vaccine to vaccinate um, all, all long-term care uh, residents and staff. So they receive the vaccine on the 21st. They have three weeks from that date to do their first round of vaccines. Um, we've heard from many facilities that they've been scheduled um, there is certainly a, a chance that they that there are some that have not been scheduled but we have regular meetings uh, teleconferences with our pharmacy partners to make sure that that they're meeting the needs of our, our residents so it's it's really important we, we are very confident that they're going to be able to fulfill their their obligations under the federal contract to vaccinate the nursing homes but it for some chance uh, in any chance that they're unable to fill, fulfill those obligations, we do have a plan B already set to go that we will pick up that ball and run with it uh, and make sure that all of our long-term care residents and staff are vaccinated timely. Governor, our last question comes from Kevin Landergan with the Union Leader. Kevin, go ahead with your question. Yeah, thanks. Question for you, Governor, and one for Commissioner Chabonet. For you, um, some states uh, are being transparent about where the vaccine is being distributed before it's being given, um, but we're not doing that at this point. Um, is that a pro again? Is that a privacy issue, or, and is there any plan after all the vaccine is distributed in phase say one A and one B to actually say how many doses went where? Yeah. The question I had for Commissioner Shibinet was about. Um, the outbreak at the prison in Berlin. Um, we had received a report that um, at, from folks that were concerned that um, some people who were transferred from Concord to the Berlin prison's D block were those who first tested positive for COVID and now um, 
there are apparently 30 cases in that block um, and wondered whether um, uh, there's any truth to that, you know, how sometimes these stories get started about the origin of a COVID outbreak. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I'm going to actually ask um, Dr. Daly. Um, she's on the front lines, I think, of both of those. Uh, we'll give her a shot at it. So I'll answer this, the second question first about the um, prison question. I don't actually have any information on that to share. I can certainly look into that, and um, you can loop back around with our public information office to follow up if you'd like. And then in terms of um, transparency with where the vaccine doses are, I think we have provided information. You know, we've received this just over 12,000 doses in this first week. We had to set aside a certain amount of that vaccine. It was 7,800 doses that had to be set aside for that long-term care facility federal contract program so that they could get that started right away on December 21st. And the remainder of the doses went to the hospitals and all, all of our hospitals in our state received vaccine and they're uh, providing those vaccines to their healthcare providers. Going forward, we will um, continue to communicate with our partners when we're ready to provide vaccine to them. And as we roll out this program where members of the general public want to sign up and know where the vaccine is, there is a federal data system that's in place called Vaccine Finder, where you'll be able to go and see where there's vaccine available for you and you can contact that organization to sign up. Um, we'll also be opening fixed, test, uh, fis, fixed vaccination sites um, to serve the population as well if they're not able to get their vaccine from their health care provider. And all of that is going to be uh, available and listed on our website as well as this Vaccine Finder website. So there will be transparency and you'll know where our doses are going. Great. So just that's a, sorry if just a follow up on Kevin's question. So ultimately would we be able to show that a certain hospital received a certain amount of vaccine, right? Yes. That that would be public information, I think, right? Uh, we can't say we wouldn't be able to say exactly who got the vaccine. We're not saying that publicly, but we could at least say the number of doses that were ad administered or given to any given hospital. Correct. And many of the hospitals are sharing this with the, with the public when asked to. So right. And, and just to follow up, Dr. Daly was saying that many hospitals are sharing that, um, you know, with the public when, when they're asked. So, yeah, we're going to, again, be as transparent as we, as we possibly can. When are we going to see the fixed location sites uh, for vaccination set up? December 29th. Uh, December 29th? Yeah. December 29th. I didn't know it was that soon either. That's great. Okay. Great. Anything sorry, else? Sorry, is that for all 13? No. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll yeah, I don't know if that's all 13, but. Um, the fixed sites will be set up in operating December 29th for the first responder and ambulatory care community. So um, we, we're going to funnel all of our first responders, police, fire, EMS, and our, and our outpatient people through our fixed sites. So that is the end of 1A, early 1B type phase. Um, phase two general population we don't know when that's going to start because we don't know what our vaccine supply is going to be you know four six weeks we're, we're working two and three weeks out so as soon as we have 1a and 1b vaccinated we'll be making announcements when phase two will be up will be starting but they'll use the same fixed sites correct? they'll use the same fixed sites and we'll additionally have mobile sites up too that that will be going around the state to to be in different uh communities to do vaccination clinics. And how are you going to manage demand versus supply? I'm assuming at a certain point there are going to be a lot of older people who are going to want to get this and only so much vaccine. Um, yep. I, I think, you know, we have different priority populations and obviously people over 65 is going to be a priority population, people with underlying medical conditions. Our hope is that a lot of those citizens will be able to get their vaccination from their, their, their provider, right? We expect that about 75% of the citizens in New Hampshire will be able to get the vaccination just by going to their regular provider. We don't expect that everybody's going to have to go through a public vaccination clinic to get a vaccine. Um, so just like you would go and and get your flu shot or get any of your other vaccinations should be should be the way that you're planning on getting vaccinated um, for COVID. Great. All right. 
Well, thank you guys very much. And, and again, um, that kind of concludes for today. We hope everyone has been able to ride the storm out. It looks like the snow is really uh, petering off in, in the rest of the state at this point. I think it is a few more hours for us to clear the roads and make sure that everyone can travel safe. It looks like we're going to have a great weekend. Uh, the vaccine is here. We're underway on that, which is just, uh, I think, great news for everybody. Um, next week, we are going to do another press conference, but it will be on Tuesday at 3 p.m., not Thursday, um, given that we're kind of getting close to Christmas. Christmas Eve probably wouldn't be ideal for, for a, uh, a COVID uh, update. But next Tuesday, the 22nd at 3 p.m. is when we'll, we will be back. Thank you, guys. Have a great weekend, everybody. All right, you were just watching state officials provide us an update on the state's coronavirus response. State health officials announcing 872 new cases today. Since March, more than 34,000 Granite Staters have tested positive. Nearly 7,000 people are actively battling COVID-19 in our state. 284 hospitalized, four more people have died. Three were linked to long-term care facilities. That raises our state's death toll from coronavirus to 629. Health officials also giving an update on the Pfizer vaccine. This week, more than 3,100 doses were distributed to state hospitals, and 901 frontline health care workers have been vaccinated over the last two days. The governor says he expects thousands more doses of doses to be delivered to the state this week and says today's storm did not impact any shipments. Lastly, an update on CARES Act funding, the one and quarter billion dollars provided by the federal government in March must be spent by December 31st. So here's a look at how the governor's the governor plans to allocate the remaining funds, four million dollars to the university system, seven million to the hardest hit hospitals and twelve million dollars will go to nonprofit.